Hey everyone, and welcome back to the Firefighters Podcast, where we seek to develop, inspire, and motivate the world of the emergency services operator through a series of wide-ranging conversations. Now, before we go any further, just hit that rate, follow, or subscribe button on whatever platform you're listening to. It's a key performance indicator for us and helps us reach even more people. Now, here's what we've got for you today. Today's podcast is definitely going to be, I'm going to say a Marmite podcast. Ask yourself the question, do you like poetry? There's a great quote from Robert Frost that says, Poetry is when an emotion has found its thought and the thought has found words. And I think that's a great introduction to today's episode because my guest today is Gerard Devine. Gerard is an award-winning Irish poet who lives a life less ordinary than most because the former carpenter is now a full-time firefighter in Dublin. Prior to joining the fire brigade, Gerard spent many years working on the building sites of Dublin, Boston and San Francisco, which we speak all about today. He still applies his building skills by volunteering to work in third world countries such as Africa, which comes up in our conversation today. An animal and nature lover, Gerard recently moved into an inspiring Wicklow Mountains where he lives in harmony with nature with his wife Steph and their rescue dog, who also gets a mention in today's episode. Again, this guy's... Life is just filled with experiences and emotion. And it shouldn't come as any surprise that the beautiful poetry this man has created comes out of a vessel such as this. Now, while his favourite poet is the wonderful W.B. Yeats, much of Gerard's poetry is inspired by Irish ballads and singers such as Shane McGowan and Christy Moore. We go in so many great directions today, and Gerard shares three or four of some of his most famous poems, so you're going to get some Really, really good food for the soul on today's episode. Some serious food for thought as well. Like the self-awareness, self-reflection that this man has and the way that he manages to articulate it through his art is truly incredible. Now, before we jump into the episode, if you do want to access more of this poetry, if you want to reach Gerard himself, we have put his email address, a link to his website and a link to his Instagram. So please do go into the notes and have a look at those. And if you want to get a signed copy sent to yourself of The Firefighter's Call, it's one of the most famous poems, you can get it there as well. And all the proceeds for this do go to charity. So there's lots of great stuff in here today, folks. A real true embodiment of the firefighter mindset and how he's used his skill and his art to help articulate some of the challenges of trauma, of that sense of lostness, that sense of identity that come from so many rough and ready knuckle dragger style jobs that have really been done by those individuals who have built the bedrock of our communities all over the world there's so much great stuff in today's episode i absolutely love my conversation with gerard and i really really hope you enjoy it too thanks for coming back to the podcast and i'll see you on the other side you numbered me with sheep to follow weak or men but wolf ripped off his clothing Blood flowed within my pen. You sank me to the ocean floor where talents cannot burn. But I'm the one who rises. You are just my churn. You tied my feet with boundaries. You dimmed my sight with fear. You screamed at me with insults to the point I could not hear. You caged my aspirations. You filled my thoughts with doubt. But now the cage is open. The lark is flying out. When demon drove a spear in me, a quest to kill my pride, I grabbed it by the blade and pulled it through the other side. I carry that spear with me into every single fight. The blood pours from the spearhead into everything I write. That's powerful. (laughs) I wrote wrote that with a chip on my shoulder, you know. It was kind of fucking... There's so many things that scream out to me when I'm listening to that. The first one that hit me was, you tied my feet with boundaries. Yeah. You're not going to... Yeah. yeah. You're not going to go anywhere. And and also, the reference to the lark, um, the lark um, is is like a beautiful bird. It's famed for its beautiful singing voice. But if you put a lark in a cage, it will never sing again and it will mm. die out of loneliness. So it's seen as like a, a bird that can never be held in captivity. And it became a symbol of freedom for Ireland. You know, so that's like I could have said, but now, now the eagle's flying out or whatever. But I, I used the lark because of that reason. It's um, What's the poem? You, do, you literally just hit me with something there because it brought back something else I remember hearing. It was... Um, <clears throat> Lex Friedman, he's a he's a podcaster from America, right. and he was guest on someone else's podcast, 
a long time ago, and he read a poem at the end of it about a bird trapped inside a man who who was a fa- it was basically a story of uh, of an alcoholic. I think okay. it is. What is it called? Ah, I'm going to have to search it and, and I'll circle back to it. Anyway, there you go. Tying my feet with boundaries. Talk to me about what that means to you, because to because this is the thing about poetry. I actually saw something uh, whilst I was preparing for our uh, our podcast this morning, and uh, it was a quote by Robert Frost. It said, "Poetry is when an emotion has found its thought, and the thought has found its words." And that is so powerful because I think you have one of those rare skills where you're able to manifest those thoughts, emotions. I think the reason poetry hits so much is because it has a, such a visceral connection to so many of us. You've managed to capture that fog in a word or in a series of words, and that when you when you speak it like that, and again when you said tie my feet with boundaries, how many people have their feet tied? But how many people tie their own feet? Because I know when we were speaking earlier, you yeah. said that, that a lot of the origin of this poem was built around uh, your your own dyslexia. Yeah, I mean, like the, every, everything about it. Like, so I thought of like, um, like the expression, like the cream always rises. So that where, um, like, you sank me to the ocean. You've talent to burn, but it, 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 you cannot burn something underwater. Okay, so it's like you sank me to the ocean floor where talent cannot burn, but I'm the one who rises. The cream will rise, and you keep cream in a churn. You are just my churn. You're just holding me in. You know, but I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna break free because, you know, life is life. If you're if you're good enough, you're gonna you're gonna surface to the top, and that you you tied my feet with boundaries. Like I remember being in school, like like you teach that you're not gonna go anywhere. Like you know, not all of them now, but you know, even in life. Did you have that when you were at school? Did you have that sort of not just imposter syndrome, but that fear that you know, people weren't uh, giving you opportunities? When did you first realize you were dyslexic? I'd say kind of the end of primary school i think um towards the end of primary school and um but there was no support there as such I, I got grinds and that um which really helped me a lot and i feel like i've, I've overcome it now um if you can yeah. overcome it but I just a lot of people to... don't don't you know they uh, some people tie their own feet that's what makes it so powerful for me you know whether it's that imposter syndrome whether it's lack of self-belief lack of and also what you do, because we'll share some links <clears throat> below for people to go and have a look at some of your videos and stuff like that. It's scary shit, you know, what you're doing, putting yourself up there. It's not like you're reciting someone else's thing. It's not karaoke. And even that shit's scary enough. Yeah, true. You are pouring your soul through these words. Yeah, and you're, you're still like, you know, you're doing karaoke, you're probably going to be half cut, you know. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's easier. <laughs> and no matter how bad you are, you're probably going to think you were brilliant. But this is like your stone cold... So it's just you, you know, in front of people standing up there. It's like when I did that poem, I did that poem, actually, I had to read it. I've only read it live once in a competition. And um, I explained at the start, I said, sometimes to fight your fear, you to fight something, you have to let your guards down. And I went on another little bit. And then when I stood up to the mic, because it's all very arty, okay, and I'm not that way. They're like, we're looking for more of a... You, um, to engage with the crowd, you know, not just the reading, a performance. <laughs> you, you said this, the like, sort well, of elitism, well, the story you know, yeah. that's in the world of poetry. Yeah, yeah. So when I said, like, sometimes to face your fear, you actually have to let your guard down. So when I stood up to the mic, I stood sideways to the mic, and I put my guard up, and I just dropped my hands down by my side and closed my eyes and gave the poem. You know, I became vulnerable. You know, I'm open, you know. And... Um, I don't know if they got it. It's not that type of an audience, but there was a few. Isn't that the thing with art, though? It is yeah. so personal, isn't it? Is it for people to get it? Do you think it's if you had if you have I had to push you into a corner and force you? Is it fifty fifty? Do you think, or is it? I feel like it's more eighty twenty. Not as in it's all just for you. Yeah, but it it is you. Yeah, um, I mean, you know, it's I, you manifesting. That's why I think it'd be so hard to write a poem for someone else exactly. because. It comes from you have to have mind you. You've written some really powerful stuff. The, the mining one that I, that I saw you write was yeah, just right, so. Yeah. 
Well, I don't know if some of it's the accent as well, though. I'm going to have a cop yeah, out there. Not yeah. to diminish the word, but <laughs> yeah, that yeah. Irish grit and passion. You can, it, you, it sounds like I can hear generations of standing in the cold fucking rain yeah. uh, and just saying, fuck you, I'm not going home. You know, that's, that's what yeah. I hear when you even start talking sometimes. This episode of the podcast is brought to you by Gore-Tex Professional Fabrics. Now, we all know the working environment of a firefighter is filled with challenges. We face serious risks on the job, such as heat exhaustion, burns, physical and mental stress. And we frequently come into contact with high levels of toxic chemicals. Now, I have been wearing Gore-Tex for nearly two decades on the front line, working in hostile environments, tackling challenging incidents from firefighting to water incidents and in urban search and rescue environments. Gore-Tex have a well-earned reputation for protecting professionals in the fire and emergency services through their family of highly innovative, waterproof, breathable moisture barriers that exceeds global performance standards and are trusted worldwide. Gore-Tex, going further together. When I, that poem, like this called The Quarryman, where I'm living now, like I look out that window, I'm looking at the lakes, right? And this, this area here is famous for it. It's, it's granite, it's, it's quarries. It used to employ like thousands. So I went up to the quarry with the dog, looked up for a look around, and I met this guy, a guy, John McAvoy, and he's like eighth or ninth generation stonemason. And he told me the history of the place. But he'd said to me, um, an amazing history, like unbelievable, okay? And if, like, it's like a, a living museum. And uh, I said, oh, yeah, what do you do yourself in the fire brigade? And he goes, oh, you must see a lot of bad things. And I said, oh, yeah, you, you, good days, bad days. And he said, uh, yeah, my, um, my brother committed suicide. And then I remember going, it was his twin, I think. And I was like, oh, Jesus. I, I remember hearing this, but it caught me off guard. But he, he opened up to me. And um, I was like, yeah, cool. So he made such an impact on me. He said, I'm going to write that guy a poem man, about this place because it's epic you know like it's an epic thing and it's it's just a real raw and i i don't care if like say the poet, poetry societies you know don't enjoy it don't like it it doesn't have to write me if i go up to john mcavoy and i, I showed him that poem and he got tears in his eyes that that's my that's my stamp of approval you know i don't i don't care i didn't write it for anyone else i wrote it for him mm-hmm. and when i deliver that i want to do that justice for him for his family you know so um and like i haven't even shared that poem yet to be honest with you but when i i showed it to the there's two kind of families of stonemasons up there there's sort of flatterties as well and i told them i was going to do this co- poem i qualified for a final of competition i'd like to do that poem and i said i'm going to do it with an action going to like bring a pickaxe and or you know or sorry a, a chisel and a, ma- a mallet and be pounding on it you know this, hey, when you start pounding it there's yeah. that rhythm because they're looking for bang. they're looking yeah, and it's they're they're looking for a performance and I go right, I'll give them a fucking performance. <laughs> like, You've because, got to have some audacity for that as well. Though. Yeah, that's, because, uh, but that's what it's about, though, isn't it? But you have You've got to, to just like, let go and immerse yourself in it. I suppose. Yeah, you have to like you have to go chest out, you know, because you're yeah, up yeah. against other people that are so so confident. Their stuff might be as good, but they so much confidence. They've been told they're brilliant. And, and I don't have that confidence yet, but what I do have is I don't give a shit. Like, you know, I don't like, I'm not there to impress them, but what happened is in saying that final, it was so undele- unbelievably impressive. They had to give it to me. You know, they just, they were like, cause people got it, you know, like my wife, Steph came with me and uh, a couple of my pals that lived out that direction. And I could feel my wife just looking at me going, what have you let me in for here? This is, <laughs> I'm getting daggers off my pals, you know. <laughs> thinking about that, mate, and think, because thinking about the person you are as well. So there'll be people listening only in audio form. You're a big guy. Uh, mm. How big are you? I'm 6'3". Six 6'3", three. Six three, probably yeah. 16, 17 stone. 17, yeah. Yeah, 17 stone. You're a big bloke. You're a strong bloke. You've got a big sporting background. You're a firefighter. Um, letting something like this uh, out mm. is is weird. Do you know yeah. what I mean? Is for a lot of people, it is it's like getting it's like I don't know, it's like getting eggs out of a cow. It's yeah, not the sort of right. thing you expect to yeah. come out of that thing. You're yeah. like, wow, that's freaking awesome! I didn't know cows made eggs do you yeah. know what I mean and it's pretty yeah. great that's probably a terrible analogy it's but do you know what I'm saying it's like 
Yeah. I did okay. think something like that. When did you first start writing poetry? I'd written, same thing with Dad said, I was writing poetry when I was a kid. But I thought it was horrendous stuff. And then he, um, he can be found one. It's actually not too bad. Like, it's probably about six or seven. Like, spelling is horrendous. Now, that's when dyslexia was in full flight there, you know. <laughs> D's were going, D's were B's, and, you know, everything was backwards and stuff. Um, but then I would have maybe written maybe two poems then. I can remember in my early 20s, my pal's dad died, and I wrote a poem about his dad for him. But I never kept a copy. And this is sounds strange, but I have three brothers and a bit younger sister as well. But we were always messing. Uh, remember, rap was big, like yeah. you know, NWA and stuff. And we would always. Yeah, my messing. sister and I used to record stuff on the. Yeah. Uh, used to have the little microphones. And yeah. We used to. We did the Jungle Book thing. I think it was the first one we ever did. And then we did. Oh, um, oh we did Fresh Prince of Bel Air. We used to record that. <laughs> we used yeah, to record I used to the Fresh Prince. That was great. Great show. <laughs> But we used to kind of just pure mess stuff. We used to like kind of like uh, like nearly did like a, a battle. We'd be myself, my old brother. We'd be against my younger brother, John and Kev, like a, a rap off. So I'd say a verse, and then maybe Kev, and then it didn't mean Pat is thinking of his one and it's come back, and it was all just you know slagging each other off. But I remember doing a party <laughs> one time and a crowd gathered around, and it's all just just pure hilarious. Everyone just taking the piss. But um, I was a I was always quite good at it. I could rhyme quite easy, like, and I, I, that's the way I learned poetry. And then there's a mad story then. Um, it's totally random. Before I came into the fire brigade, I think it was in my early 20s, and we were over in San Francisco. I was living there, and uh, myself, Palma and Damo, we went out, we went kind of a bit mad on, on the beer in the town, you know. We're in a dodgy part of town in, in, in this Irish bar. And your man kept us in for a lock-in. So I think it was like a Sunday night, we left the place about half three in the morning. We go outside and we see a guy getting robbed. Okay, like he's up against kind of a, the shutters of a shop. There's a big, massive black guy, like a big, big, like a bear, you know. And he has him, and your man's kind of going through his pockets. And he, there's a woman with him as well, you know. Yeah, his, his his chick was with him, with the black guy, like. And um, we're like, shit, what will we do? You know, we should do something. And then I was kind of look. We're drunk. It's not our city. You know, shit happens. Let's not get involved. Let's just walk away. And then we we heard your man's acting. He's like, I don't know. That's, that's, I don't really have much, you know. We're like, he's Irish, you know. And we go, right. We got to do something. <laughs> so I was like, I said to them, so we're both drunk, right? Let me handle this, okay? And he's like, yeah, okay, okay. So I just walked over and I grabbed your man by the shoulder. I, I didn't know who he was, the Irish guy. I just grabbed him and said, hey, Steve, what's, how's it going? You know, come on, let's, let's go. You know, and I grabbed him, pulled him out of there. And next thing, I just got this like big, like, it's like a bear paw. Just, I felt heavy just on my shoulder, like, grabbed me like, where are you going? And I'm there going. Um, I said, I'm just going home, pal. Yeah, good night, take care. And uh, he goes, you're robbing my business. That's what you're doing. And I was like, that. listen, man, we don't want any trouble, you know. We're just going home. Uh, take care. And you one says, going, kick his ass, kick his white ass. And I'm like, oh, here we go. You know? and, then, and next minute, now, now I'm looking up at this guy. He was a monster, right? How fucking big and, is this guy? You're huge. Oh, man, he, was, he was like six, seven or something. He was huge. And I didn't, God. I didn't really want to tackle him. And uh, he goes, yeah, maybe I should kick your ass, you know. And I was like, Listen, pal, I'll, uh, I'll be honest with you. If, you. if you want to have a row, fine, I said. But we can solve this another way. And he's there. What are you talking about? What other way is it? And they just, I don't know how I wasn't. Obviously, he didn't have a gun, but he would have just shot me. Because like, nowadays, if I said this, I just said, uh, I see you're black. Do you rap? And he goes, and he just, <laughs> swear to God, man, right? Couldn't write this. <laughs> he just looked at me, he's like, I mean, what if I cut him? I fucking rap. My mother says, right, okay. I'll give you a rap off. All right. And if, and if, <laughs> if, if I win, he comes home with us. I said, if you win, you can do whatever the hell you want with him. And, uh, he's like, yeah. And with that, your man turned to Dave and goes, is your friend a rapper? And Dave goes, no, he's just, a, he's just a fucking lunatic. <laughs> but, <laughs> I swear you. And your man just started this on every second word, <laughs> N word or black. I'm a black. I'm a you know. And I'm like, but while he's going on and on, 
I'm thinking of my stuff, like, and I just hit him with it, right? And uh, I won't repeat it, like, but it's just like pure. And then your one put it in, I was like, shut up, you know, tell him. <laughs> <laughs> it was a banana scenario. And then, uh, but I kicked his ass and he goes, man, that's some pretty good shit, you know. And goes, How long have you been rapping for? I said, oh, I was, man, I was totally out of breath. about 30 seconds there, pal. And, <laughs> And he goes, man, it's some good shit. And I said, what are you doing robbing lads? I said, I don't be robbing Irish lads outside an Irish bar. Like, he said, yeah, man, I, you know, I, I needed the money. And I said, you needed the money, man? He goes, yeah, yeah my apartment is shit. And I said, and we were literally going down to sleep in Golden Gate Park, right? Because then we'll start, we're working there in the morning, you know? Like, and we were like, you're, man, we're, we're staying the night in the park. And he's like, yeah, man, it's rough as hell, man. <laughs> And I said, look, I said, uh, I brought him over to a, to a, like a window. And uh, now I'm drunk, right? I bring my, grab him by the elbow, bring him up to the window. I said, uh, my dad says, if you wake up in the morning and you look in the mirror and you like the person you see, you're not all the way there, but you're halfway there. Now, do you like what you see in that mirror? And he just looks, he just looks and says, I've done some pretty bad shit. <laughs> <laughs> it's just... It was just a banana story. Like I said, well, look, it's not too late to change, pal. That's some Tony Robbins shit. You changing lives in the middle of the night. It was mad. But then uh, when we said, oh, we're going to stay in the parking lot, you can stay with me, like, you know. And so we ended up crashing in his house. It was all good. Never (laughs) seen him. Never seen him uh, since or anything, you know. But uh, I'd say, I'd say the next day he, he was telling people that story. Like, yeah, I was getting robbed and some guy came along and he had a wrap off, like, and, he, he, he won my freedom, you know. So that was my first real intense bit of poetry, I suppose, you know. How old would you have been then? Um, maybe 26, maybe. Yeah. So it lied dormant for, for quite some time. Because you, you joined the fire brigade when you were 18, didn't you? No, no, I was later. I, I've been in it about um, 18, 19 years now. Um, I got into it when I was about 27, but it didn't come around for me. I was, I was actually 30 when I started. Wow. Some, yeah. What were you going to do it? I was working in build, building sites um, and in doing a bit of personal training and stuff. It, just the security of it, to be honest with you. And I, I play Gaelic football. Um, Jesus. It's an Irish game. It's, I don't know if you see it. Yeah, I, I play Very hurling cool. as well. And do you know hurling? Do you ever see hurling at all? Yeah. Uh, it's class, like with, with sticks, you know, but it's, it's, a, it's our national sport, you know. And so there's a couple of guys in my club who were like, listen, you, you should join the fire brigade, like, or at least go for it, you'd love it. And I'd never um, really looked into it too much. Just, you know, it just passed me by. But then the more I looked into it, I was like, oh, man, this is awesome. So, um, yeah, I just took it from there. I went for it. Luckily, I got it. Um, but, I mean, I was, in, I was in the state. I did the exam and stuff. And then I was told, right, you've qualified for the interview. And I'd say the interview was on a Wednesday. I, I was living in California at the time then. I was kind of set up there. But I came home the day before the interview. Had to go straight to the barbers. And that was closed. So one of my brothers shaved. Because I had my hair kind of long and blonde. Like, you know, I've dyed blonde. Like, you know, what were you doing there. living in California? Yeah, yeah. I was working over there. The building sites, working on the bars. And just yeah, living the dream a bit. Um, Jesus. Yeah, I, I went over there playing hurling. And Gaelic football, and I just fell in love with the place, and I stayed, you know. Um, That's rarer than you think it is as well. Or or is it in Ireland? Like, do people oh, have is. that get up and go, oh. chase chase the dream, just go and fuck around and find yeah. out? Because there's a lot of people that say they're going to do stuff like that. It never happens. Yeah, true. Like, my, I say Gaelic football, I was picked to go off to, to Boston. I was only 19, but I, I was the first of my friends to do that. Like, no one had gone to the States and it was like no more my phones then i was told my club is red and white like red wear your red and white tracksuit top you'll arrive in logan airport in boston and there'll be a dublin fella called keith will come up and look after you i'm like okay so <laughs> you know and <laughs> you arrive in dublin airport you're trying to make a call home to your mom to let her know you got there safe and i couldn't even do that i had no dollars or nothing and i'm standing there in a red track to top with a gear bag, you know, and the fellow was like, Are you, you, you're Jerry. Yeah, I was there going, yeah, yeah, he was like, yeah, you're a big fucker. Yeah, I was there. Yeah, I said, right, come on, let's go. 
and that was it. And he, we, we, um, he brought me down to South Boston where he was staying. It's so all very, very Irish. And then into the Black Rose Cafe in town. And I got my first ever uh, American hamburger and a, a pint of orange. You know, you have to be 21 to drink, but he, you know, a pint of orange. I was just there, man, this is amazing. This is, this is fantastic, you know. But, um, and then I did that for, for a while. And then I went over to California and, uh, I was always into BMX and skateboarding as well. I was always influenced by the American stuff. And um, next thing, I'm, I'm, I'm on, standing on the pier in Santa Cruz, you know, and I grew up looking at Santa Cruz skateboards and all. I was just like, this is amazing. And everyone else is taking it for granted. But I'm like, I'm like the Pope trying to kiss the ground. I go, this, this, is, this is amazing. I, I love yeah. this. And with and the great Irish community over there. Yeah, so everyone kind of looked out for each other. And uh, working in an Irish bar and then working, doing concreting and stuff, like hard, hard grafts, you know, and a lot of heat. Um, like, like I remember in Boston, actually, I got a job doing roofing and I was told, listen, this is tough work. I said, no problem. Um, eight of us started, it was a Thursday, eight of us started on the Thursday. I was the only one went back for the Friday. The lads didn't even go back to get paid in case they got put in the van again. Like it was bananas. We were roofing this, uh, massively it was a, an ice skating rink but the heat like you, you pick up a hammer and burn your hand you know you hold a nail and burn your you burn your fingers like um and i remember going like this is hell on earth yeah and i was looking at the name of the arena it was divine arena my surname i was like oh, man, that's a sign that this is this is a test and they try and break you as well because i think they want they don't want lads to come up back nearly so they'd just get a free day's work out of well I was yeah. fucking breaking me like you know so it's the only one you know that went back you know so uh, stuff yeah. like that's hard graph mate I mean, I've never seen it in California but I did roof him with yeah. my old man for years and I, yeah. I, I do I do worry worry is probably a bit of a grand time for it but it is those trades really are dying um, as yeah. we diversify skills and mindsets and you know our expectations of life it does make me think what, you know, the future generations of, I think those sort of skill sets are going to be more and more valuable because so few people are getting apprenticeships in them. So few people are doing those things now. Yeah, true. And that's, I have a lot of respect for like, um, lads, like one of my pals dropped in last night, like, you know, they're, they're just hardworking guys, like, you know, they're like the stone mates. There's, I describe them as lads that earned their beards. Do you know what I mean? Like they have them because they're they're up too early to have a shave. You know they're they're, they're grafters, like they're hardworking men. Like they're you go up to the quarries and no matter how many masks they wear, they, they've got like lines of dust and it's in their ears. It's everywhere. Like you know they're just um hardworking guys and and the farmers as well. I look down out here onto onto the fields. And I remember we were going to bed one night. It was it must have been midnight, and they're still out. You can see the tractor lights. Mm. You know, it reminded me of, um, you know, you go skiing or snowboarding, you can still see the lights on the mountain yeah. and uh, you see the lights going around. And I'm like, they know something we don't. And sure enough, the next day it rained for about two weeks straight. Like, But they had to get their whatever they're bringing in mm. done, you know. So it's just just a lot of respect for those. Different uh, human beings. Those trades, you know, Different those. human beings. Yeah. But again, yeah. like like you were alluding to, you didn't have technology and stuff when, when you were young, neither did I really. So you couldn't. You couldn't see what the you know nineteen year old version of Gerard in California was doing, so you yeah. didn't have that fear of missing out that seems no. to be so prevalent in people these days. Because if you did, if you were just farmer in in Ireland, you you didn't see yeah. nothing outside of ten miles. You know, you saw yeah. some shit on the TV about whatever yeah. bombs are dropping somewhere or you know whatever's funny on on the news at the minute. But yeah. your world was smaller. I know, yeah, there's a great, uh, there's a, I love lyrics, there's a great, uh, it's uh, Simple Minds, um, there's, they, they have a, a line, if I hadn't seen such riches, I could live with being poor. You know, you don't, yes. you know, they, they don't know, and uh, I could do a bit of work in Africa, and we're giving them the internet and stuff, and it's, it's great, like, but then again, you're opening them up to, like, they haven't seen Puff Daddy in his big yacht, or Beyonce in all her jewellery, or J-Lo, or anything. Like, they don't know any better. So kind of hard, going, though, mate. I mean, one well, of my favorite sayings is comparison is the thief of joy. And I often think yeah. when I do spend 20 minutes 
Uh, you know, I'll make an excuse like, okay, I always say if I didn't have an online business, which is kind of what the podcast is, I wouldn't use social media. Yeah, you probably fucking would though, Pete. You know, you're just saying yeah. shit like that. You know? And I almost provoke myself sometimes. And I provoke myself into workouts. I provoke myself into so yeah. much stuff. I'm just like, you piece of shit. You hypocrite. Do you know what I mean? You yeah. fucking, you know, and then just goading myself into doing stuff. But how many times when you have spent 20 minutes, 30 minutes, an hour, on social media, do you do you come away from it going, oh, that was really fun. I really enjoyed that. I feel better because I've wow. just done that. Never fucking happens. Yeah, yeah, I know. What and are you doing? But they reel you in. Like, I'm like, I'm to look at stuff like woodworking and next thing you're like, you're seeing a guy build a log cabin and you're like, man, that's that's cool. And next thing, there's a great white shark about to kill something. You're like, yeah. oh man, how would you know? You know and an hour and a half later, yeah. you're like, what yeah. was I looking at? Yeah. But um, I nearly... Um, I tried to, to discipline myself, but then I looked like your, your average uh, phone hours last week was three hours 20 or something. I go, well, what? Now, a lot of that, it's me. I, I use my phone for poetry as well. So it's like just putting in notes maybe. I don't know yeah, if that yeah. records. I make loads of notes on my phone. I think it's part of the ADHD brain. Just It's a way of coping with stuff. I've got lists and notes. And yeah, and I listen to Spotify or audiobooks almost nonstop. Like when I finish doing this, the earphones will go in and I'll go and have some food and I'll spend some time with my yeah. daughter. But there's pretty much always something because I, I think of like weighting the scales in my brain. I'm always trying to pour good stuff in because right. good, bad stuff's always going in. I would yeah, say you don't learn, you absorb. You know, the people that you're around and even with my kids, they're not just hearing what you're saying, they're seeing what you're doing. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So or that's why I don't watch the news and, and all that sort of stuff. Because all of that stuff is going in. Whether or not you think you're absorbing it, whether or not you think you're paying attention to it, it's going in. It's all going into your head. So I try and balance it <clears throat> and I try and control it. I try and stand guard at the door of my yeah. mind to stop yeah. a lot of that stuff going in or at least make sure I'm putting in twice as much good. In other news, this episode is brought to you in partnership with MSA Safety. Today, we have them to thank for the improved firefighter safety through connectivity in their brand new connected firefighter system. At the center of the connected firefighter platform is the MSA M1 SCBA with telemetry. You can view battery life, air pressure, and estimated time remaining either independently on the M1 itself or from the lunar connected device screen. Also, still with the air status, alarm information, search status, and all of this provided to the incident command for confident decision making during the scene. That integrates straight in with the lunar system, which is a wireless all-in-one device creating an independent search and rescue network, providing edge detection, enhanced personal thermal imaging, while simplifying post-scene reporting and data retention. One of the key parts of the Luna is their FAST system, the Firefighting Assisting Search Technology. This combines directional and distance information with thermal imaging to help find separated teammates and decrease response time. It actually connects you to the other crews in the vicinity for a unified search during the time of mutual aid by instantly notifying the network of lunar devices when there is a downed crew member, allowing for a prompt search and rescue. All of this then plugs into the FireGrid system for cloud-based connectivity, real-time information, and data-driven decisions for the incident commander. It enables you to see the exact location of your firefighters on the scene. And it doesn't require you to be sat on the station. The MSA hub then provides a wireless gateway straight to the cloud, enabling wireless on-scene data for local and remote incident command for additional eyes on the scene. MSA are truly taking massive strides in the future of improved firefighter safety through connectivity. MSA is dedicated to increasing safety in the fire service through technological advancements. Various feature enhancements, new products, partnerships, and integrations will provide additional capabilities readily accessible by products, software, and services in the brand new MSA Connected Firefighter platform. Now back to the show. Yeah, absolutely. Like I remember my dad as kids, and like we were like we were always into our they loved Iron Maiden, for example, and all that's so all our T-shirts, you know, the misfits, and be schools, you know, and whatever. And uh, I remember my dad. Our T-shirts used to just go missing. His <laughs> dad was like binning them, you know. <laughs> but he said to me later, like, I remember I had a, a, a deadly Anthrax T-shirt. I think I can't remember. And, uh, but that went AWOL, you know, and like, you're taking like three weeks, to, you know, to, to save for this, you know, doing your paper around. And you're like, Dad, like, how come clothes are going into the wash and they're not coming out, you know? <laughs> you're like, I oh, know there's a hole in that, so I threw it out, you know? <laughs> but years later, he goes, So I genuinely thought it was very dark and I just thought it was going to make an impression on you guys, you know? I want, yeah. you know, like, so I don't know, maybe he was right, but it is, it is if you start listening, like all the news is negative, like it yeah. break your heart, like you it's know. Not so news. You, 
And uh, now my wife, she she likes all these crime documentaries and these things. I can't look at them, you know, because I, I've you know, probably like I've been to murder scenes. Yeah. You know, I've seen I've seen an old man lying on on the ground with his, his head blown up and, and your own had been hit with something obviously, and you're like you can feel the presence of evil in that room. Like this evil was in here to do that, like, you know? And you're kind of going, I don't want to relive that. And even all these shows, like, um, you know, about drug dealers, like re- true life drug dealers and, you know, and it kind of glorifies it a bit in my opinion. But I see the other side, like you to yourself, I see that, I see for every one person that's having a great night in cocaine, there's, there's, you know, three people dying of heroin. Yeah. You know? So, <coughs> heroin and fentanyl just, overdoses and all that sort of stuff. It's yeah. um, there's a great book, uh, entertaining ourselves to death. I think it was called. Uh, I forget the guy's name, but um, it speaks about when we started putting music on the news and stuff like that, and it stopped being news and it became entertainment. And there was yeah. a detachment right. aspect to it where we didn't look yeah. at these people as people; they're just characters yeah. in a play. We don't really yeah. connect to what it means. We see figures, we see numbers, statistics, we see a scene of a dead body. You've not, you're not there. And you can't differentiate between film and you know reality and, and fiction or now. It's just like, unless you've been there yourself, like you're like, I don't, I don't. Yeah. That's not what I see when you're watching that because I've been to yeah. something similar, not the same, but I've been to something yeah. similar, and uh, I I don't see what the entertainment factor in is in this. If it's an educational thing and you you think you're yeah. learning something about it, maybe I kind of get it, but <clears throat> you have got to yeah, you've got to stand guard. Yeah, it's like it's like you know the way some someone show I've checked this out and it's someone getting it, someone get, maybe getting shot, you know, robbery or so or whatever, and you're kind of going, like you're you're actually watching someone getting murdered, yeah. you know, and I'm like, what what are you showing me that for? Like, don't ever show me that again. I don't want to see that stuff, you know. Yeah. I want to see someone doing volleying a, a scissors kick into the top corner. I want to see something that's going to you know, yeah. or someone in the gym, you know, that's going to inspire me. Like, um, but um. No, I don't. Because I think detached trauma is almost worse because you have no context for it. And I think this is where first responders, emergency services, and certainly control operators struggle because you can't complete the story in your head. You don't know what happened before and we don't sometimes know what happened after. And then when yeah. that's, that's made even worse when people just watch this disaster porn when someone is getting stabbed, shot, whatever. And you're like, you've got no context for that. You've just exposed yourself to something really traumatic and horrific and you've got yeah. no idea. Did they live? Did they die? Yeah. Yeah. Was it their fault? Were they a rapist? Did they deserve it? What you know? Yeah. I don't know what to do with that information. Yeah, I know. And there's always there'll always be some some memory that lingers or something that reminds you. Yeah. Of that scenario, like like we we know, we know, um, a lady got knocked down. It was quite close to where I was living in Dublin, and. She got knocked down, but she was nice. Like, you know, one of these kind of prams that you push, you know, these kind of square prams. She's just doing her shopping, crossing the road, a car hit her, guy on his phone. And we were talking to her, like, I was on the fire truck, and uh, the ambulance arrived. I was like, look, you're going to be okay. And she goes, oh, you're great, lads. You know, she seemed okay. But anyway, she was taken to hospital, and um, I met the ambulance guys later on. I said, hey, how's that lady? She goes, she, man, she didn't make it. I said, what? I said, her BP was internal bleeding or something, you know, they, so it was, and I was like, are you, are you kidding me? Like, you know, because I, 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 I just kind of remembered her, but where she'd fallen, there was a little bit of blood on the, on the curb. Not, not much, like, you know, yeah. not, but it was, a, it was a kind of a warm couple of weeks and that blood was constantly there and I'd drive by that, that corner all the time going to my parents, you know, so I was driving away that maybe, Two or three times a day, and every time, even now that the blood is well washed away, obviously, every time I go by the corner, I think of that lady. You know, yeah. you know, it's it's just sad. Like I'm not like I'm game ball man. I don't have like nightmares over there, but it's just it's just it's just reminders of these, and they're everywhere. And you know yourself, they're everywhere in our city. Yeah. I um I actually wrote a poem about it. Just um I haven't shared it, but it's called Christchurch Cathedral. Christchurch Cathedral would be one of our landmark buildings. You know, it'd be like your, I don't know, your Big Ben, Buckingham Palace. It's a really, it's a beautiful building. Would you like to share? Uh, um, don't have to. Yeah, actually, I don't mind. Yeah, actually, I think I don't have a, I, I know what off, I think. But there's a couple of, the whole point of the poem is that someone goes and they go, oh, Christchurch Cathedral, you know, or Buckingham Palace, like, what a beautiful building. But for me, it's not, it's ruined because I, I went to a case there where, you know, a guy had overdosed. 
and there was a fucking kid in the pram. And I remember because there was a, a shadow from the church in this kind of lane beside the church, and the the guy who had a, was having the overdose was in the sunshine part, but there was a kid in a pram, like like a buggy type thing, yeah. maybe two years of age, unable to talk, and maybe maybe in the shade. It was just it was like a, like a movie scene. I was like, this is bananas. Like yeah. so now that landmark is ruined for me. Yeah. But inside the church is, is supposed to be amazing that I'm thinking, okay, maybe if I go inside, it can redeem it. Like, it's it, the poem is about kind of inner beauty. Yeah, I, I'll say it for you if you, if you like. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's, yeah. It's, go it's, for it, brother. So this is called Christchurch Cathedral. And just before I start this poem, the, um, the Pale is a reference to Dublin City. It was known as the Pale. And uh, as blue as my flag, or the Dublin flag is blue. In a lane split by shadow from Christchurch Cathedral, another day, another dollar, courtesy of the needle. Lying limp as spilt concrete as sunken eyed male with pinpoint pupils, unconscious and frail. Child cries in a pram for now all they have is no comprehension what's happened their dad, who's as blue as my flag yet feeling no pain, roulette liquid bullet shot straight in the vein. This chiseler at the apex of a spiralling slide, but I'll finish at six, and I'll pay them no mind. God, I wish that were true, but I am what I am. My skin may be thickened, but my heart gives a damn. Bells ring from the landmark by the Anna Liffey, and amidst startled seagulls the guilt engulfs me. I've never set foot inside Christchurch Cathedral, a mere railing away from this resident evil. I must pay the visit. Sooner rather than later, for the pale breaks my heart, though I try not to hate her. But cathedral in her beauty will redeem me somehow. Well, I hope so, for the outside, it's ruined to me now. Oh, mate, I love that. It's powerful. I, did I read that okay? I, you read it perfectly. Bit. You read it perfectly. I loved it. Yeah. And he's very, very strong, like you say, the, what something means to people. And, and it actually makes me think a lot about other things around the world, other pyramids, other monuments and things like that, because yeah. what they meant when they were built or what they stand for um, is sometimes exactly. very detached now from what we're doing. Do you know what I mean? From, yeah. or from what we see when we look at it, what it means to us now. Yeah. It's very, very different. Um, and I think I think it's very difficult for people stuff like that. I, I think it changes. Like I mean, you, you like you go for a nice walk in, in in your local park, but if you've been to a that park or someone has hung themselves off a tree, it's a it's a different park to you now. Someone from you the know, military where, told me that's no. what they think is more difficult about the first responders' job. Because I was speaking to yeah. a friend of mine in the military, and he spoke about trauma. He said, "I'll never go back there," and it was related to a, a deployment that he'd had uh, overseas. Um, mm. he said I don't think I could go back there and I said oh yeah totally understandable mate he says how do you do it I said I've, n- I've never been to war you know I don't and he says yeah but how do you because I was an on-call firefighter for 10 years and I've also been a whole time firefighter for much longer I think and you live and work in the community so you yeah. know and especially around me it's a rural area lots of very fast roads Lots of uh, lots of fatalities, lots of car crashes, lots of uh, motorcyclists that have come to pieces, cars that have gone under the side of lorries, lorries on the wrong side of the road, suicides. I went to a guy a long time ago that jumped off a bridge in front of a train. And these are areas that you go back to with your kids. You know, I've been to that train station many times because there's only one in my town. And the bridge is about... Yeah. <clears throat> 60 meters not even that 50 meters from the train station you stand there and see the train come down under the bridge and that's where the guy jumped from and that, that's just one of many examples you know yeah I've pulled a few people out of local rivers and things like that and it does taint things like that absolutely and it's very strange uh-huh. because also a lot of people know that you were there mm-hmm. you know when uh, when you have an incident in a local area people say oh did you go to that job yesterday you know, people that aren't even part of the emergency services. And it forces you yeah. back into recalling it and <clears throat> recalling all that in your head. Yeah, you're right. Like, I mean, there was, um, I think they set up in Dublin uh, City there, they had like one of these, uh, like like a ramp, like a 
whatever quarter pipe in, in the water for like wakeboarding and a zip line that pulls you along and you, you know, shoot yeah. off the ramp and my pals were going to it but I didn't want to go there I didn't go because that just I've pulled bodies out of there that pretty much that exact spot so now it's it's gone I don't want to be in that water yeah. you know I'm not gonna be wrong if I have to go in I'll go in but like not by choice I yeah. don't want to be I'm not going to volunteer to play around on, the, on, a, on a wakeboard um, yeah so it does it, it, yeah and that's the problem with uh, you know because our job like they, you generally kind of try and get stationed in your local station yeah. because of for new times and that but then there is the chance that you're going to be going to yeah. you know people you know and yeah. um, so it's 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 tough like that. I um, spoke yeah. earlier about um, that bluebird poem. It was Charles Bukowski. Um, I'd love to share oh, with yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. Are you familiar with he's it? He's great. Yeah, yeah, I know him. Yeah, he's brilliant. Yeah, he's. Uh, I, I, he's I'd, I'd love to read that one because I know all the poetry you'll be sharing today is uh, is ones from yeah. yourself. But um, <clears throat> I'm yeah, going to well, read this one for the benefit of other people as well because when I read this first it spoke to me and, it, and it's why it hit me when you first when we first started having a conversation today because it says about being scared of letting out who you are um your true yeah. emotions your true desires maybe a dream maybe a passion that you have maybe something that you would love to embrace and explore um but you just lock it down you close it you suffocate it so um this is Charles Bukowski uh, is a famous American poet, and this poem's called Bluebird. There's a bluebird in my heart that wants to get out, but I'm too tough for him. I say stay in there. I'm not going to let anybody see you. There's a bluebird in my heart that wants to get out, but I pour whiskey on him and inhale cigarette smoke. And the whores and the bartenders and the grocery clerks never know that he's there. There's a bluebird in my heart that wants to get out, but I'm too tough for him. I say, stay down. Do you want to mess me up? Do you want to screw up the works? Do you want to blow my book sales in Europe? There's a bluebird in my heart that wants to get out, but I'm too clever. I only let him out at night sometimes, when everybody's asleep. I say, I know that you're there, so don't be sad. Then I put him back, and he's singing a little in there. I haven't quite let him die. When we sleep together like that, with our secret pact, and it's nice enough to make a man weep. But I don't weep. Do you? And I just freaking love that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sure yeah, yeah, I've butchered yeah. it to death. <laughs> yeah. It's so yeah, It's powerful. the tough guy, isn't it? It's the tough guy, you know, keep the... Yeah. yeah. And I've been that yeah. guy so many times. Yeah. Yeah. And I think the, the podcast was actually a way of trying to let that curious child back out because the, predominantly the podcast is, is listened to in audio form. So the fact that I'm six foot five, 18 stone and do all the physical stuff and the weightlifting and the blah, blah, blah is irrelevant. But that was so much of who I was for so long. That was 90% yeah. of my identity. And that curious, playful kid that also loved poetry and conversation and, and learning, um, I just suffocated him with muscle and weights and trying to be this tough guy. Yeah, here, here's your brother. Like, you know, I mean, like, if you're, you know, if you're going to be dumb, you've got to be tough type thing. You know that way you got to, like, if you're going to be vulnerable, you've got to look after yourself. That's one of the reasons I always trained. Mm. But my, he was talking about the poetry to my brother. And brother Pat is a very smart guy. He said to me, um, he said, uh, like, expression is the opposite of depression. You know, if you, like, if you, if you hold it in, you know, so like if your thing is your podcast, imagine if you didn't do that and you just had all this potential inside you, it would just, it would just eat you up from the inside. And that's well, like it did. Kind of that, was, that, was, that was what the addiction was, I think. It was, yeah. uh, it was unspent energy. It was unrealized exactly. desires, unrealized potential or passion. So your expression could be could be singing, it could be socializing, it could be could be running, going to the gym, whatever. Imagine like, I don't know, imagine if Da Vinci wasn't allowed to paint, you know, like... It's, it's it would drive you crazy that's where it kind of comes from like it's like you know expression is the opposite of depression so when i was saying to him about poetry is it a bit like and he's there man put it out there like and uh even writing stuff such as i say i write from the heart blah 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 and he goes no no one cares they'll know when they hear you 
you know so like it's if you're passionate about something, I mean, you don't have to do explaining. You just have to open open your mouth and put it out there. Like you're doing with your podcast. It's easy for you to do this podcast because you're passionate about the fire brigade. It's easy now. Yeah. used to be very hard because you're full of imposter syndrome. It's still not easy. Now the hard yeah. bits are logistical things and, and all that sort of jizz. But it used to be, oh, God, I sound like a dick. You know, God, just that's paranoia. That, yeah. You know, that, that's, oh, God, who do I think I am, blah, blah, blah. And realize, no one gives a shit, Pete. No one cares. Just exactly, Pete. I was going to say, at the end of the day, no no one really cares. And, you, you, like, you look back at, at your, yourself, like, um, I don't know, as a teenager, a nervous teenager, trying to ask the girl out, like, you think about, no. Oh, mate. If you went back to school you know, now, what would it be like? I'd be cleaning up. I'd just be, <laughs> you just wouldn't care. Would you be, I, I, I'm a serial flirt now. I'm married but oh yeah. mate, I flirt with everyone, man, woman, that playfulness, that oh, and it's just fun. Yeah. Life is connection, you know. Life yeah. is oh, it's playfulness, yeah. you know. It's getting in the sandpit. Yeah, I was I was always brave in that way. Actually, I used to love, I used to just love that you know the panic, the heartbeat, and like you know what I mean. I used to like put myself in awkward scenarios nearly on purpose. You get you get a you get a rush from it, you know, asking a girl, you know. And it, that bit that bit does but, worry but, me but, about uh, being married. I'll be totally transparent, like. The first kiss or the first date, you know, not having yeah. that again, that's that's a bit sad. Yeah. But uh, yeah, no, I, I I'm boxing above my weight with my missus, like so I'm blessed. Like I know, you know like, there's many more firsts yeah. to have as well. You know, first kid, first house, yeah. first dog, first first goodbye. You know, one day um, yeah. there'll be there'll be powerful things as well. Yeah. Ever heard the quote that true leaders are readers? Well, we believe this is true. Listeners often ask where we go to keep our finger on the pulse of what's happening in the sector globally. So there are a few key publications which I encourage you to go check out. Now, if you're looking for insights on disaster management, fire protection, and firefighting for us, we go to Asia Pacific Fire Magazine. And when you're looking for the latest on the Middle East fire protection industry and fire services, it's Gulf Fire Magazine. And our quarterly check-in is with International Firefighter Magazine, reporting to municipal, industrial, and fire training professionals. Now, next Next up and widely accepted to be the global voice for passive and active fire protection. This is a good one. It's International Fire Protection Magazine. And finally, and perhaps the most relevant to our predominantly UK audience, I'd strongly suggest subscribing to UK Fire Magazine, reporting to the United Kingdom fire protection industry and fire services. We're really excited to announce that after a long-standing relationship of mutual respect, we've now partnered with MDM Publishing, who bring you all of these essential publications. Because in a world of change, the learners shall inherit the earth, while the learned shall find themselves perfectly suited for a world that no longer exists. Eric Hoffer said that, and I believe he was right. So keep growing, keep learning, and keep yourself in the know and at the cutting edge of what's happening globally by dropping into the notes. And as a gift from the podcast, you can actually subscribe to any of these publications for free using the link in our notes. Now back to the show. There's loads more stuff I want, I want us to, to, to explore. One of, the, um, one of the ones that you sent to me because uh, you spoke a little bit around uh, mining earlier, there was there was one you done about mining, and there was another one which was just so fucking powerful. And I think it had connotations from your work as well. I cut rope, the poem that you shared with me some time ago. Yeah, um, where did that, that come was? From? Um, <clears throat> well, I tell you where that came from. That's another again. It's another one that's unshared. Um, I was out somewhere. This is a few years ago. Um, good few years ago. I was only in the job. And I think we were in the company of girls. We were trying to, you know, chat up a few girls. And there's one of, one of the lads, like, he just, and I said, I'd never, you know, when you're asked, you know, what do you do? And you say, oh, I'm a, fire, I'm a fireman, you know. And it's a great car. Like, you know, and we're like, oh, but of course, this guy is with, was a bit of a dick. And he was trying to belittle me. And he's like, gosh, all you do is, you know, play play pool and drink tea, you know. And, you know, and, and I'm going, uh, you know, it's not really, not really like that, you know. And he goes, yeah, yeah. So I, did, I didn't get into it, but it, it really annoyed me because I'd actually been to a hanging, um, that shift, you know, and I wasn't long in the job. And I was like, but I didn't want to, I wasn't going to bring that up in a, you know, I'm trying to chat up Jake's here. I'm not going to, like, you know, kill, kill, the, kill the room. But um, it always stayed with me. I, I, felt like, I felt like grabbing your man by the throat. I said, you've no real idea. Like, like the shit we have to do sometimes that if I do get a chance to play pool and drink a cup of tea, I'm going to take them and I'm going to jump on that because, you know, because that's a, that's the good side of the job because when we work, we work. So I wrote this poem called I Cut Rope and um, it's basically about a horrible aspect of our job is, is cutting people down. 
And I showed it to a fr- friend of mine. As I said, I haven't shared this poem, but a pal of mine in work, uh, a guy who I'd really admire, a couple of years older than me, but I, I describe him as, a, as a, tough, a tough nut, I suppose. He would have played Gaelic football at a high level. We would have played against each other. It's gas. We would have hated each other. You know, I would have tried to take his head off him the same with me. And now we're like, you know, we're, we're best pals. You know? yeah. And um, But he's has his own personal struggles with uh, with cancer, actually. And I wrote him a poem for him, just for, you know, it's just, just for him. And it's a, uh, and so he, he's a, he's a fan of my stuff. So I wrote this poem I could wrote and I had a word in him and I brought him into a, like a, a room off the, uh, off the bay. And uh, we're in there and um, I said, look, I wrote this poem and I wanted to show it to you because he cut three people down in the one week. And the third one was outside, outside of work. It was his own brother. Okay. So I said, I'm going to show you this poem. I'd like you to read it. And if you don't want this to go any further, it never will, I promise. But if you give me your blessing, I'm going to share it one day. And uh, he said, okay, yeah. This is called I Cut Rope. I cut rope while other folk go merry on their way. I cut rope so many times it's really hard to say. I cut rope one handed as I clung on to the tree. I cut rope that was taught from lifeless gravity. I cut rope in sadness as loved ones start to fray. I cut rope not for love. I cut rope for pay. I cut rope in urgency. I never hesitate. I cut rope with the blade as colleagues bear the weight. I cut rope through tragedy for those who feel alone. I cut rope with great respect as if it were my own. I cut rope for young and old that haunt me evermore. Oh, what I'd give to never, ever cut the rope once more. I really like that one. I remember when you said it to me and uh, it's almost the, uh, it felt like the burden of responsibility, you know, the burden of the job, the thing we aggrandize people. And it makes me reflect back on that conversation about military, police, firefighters. It's like when people say, oh, I'd love to do what you do. And you're like, maybe. Yeah. And it's gas. There's a, there's a lady in Canada and she champions my work. She's very good. Actually, she's very kind of very helpful, actually. And I, there's a kind of thing on Instagram where she can read it live. And she, she'll always read my stuff. And it's great to hear your own stuff because straight away you'll pick up a, a mistake or an error, you know. Um, but she read this and uh, she goes, she's really cool. Like, uh, she's an older lady. And she's like, oh, we got another one here from Gerard. We're going to read this. And it's called I Cut Rope. You know, she's all real jovial. And she read it. And she goes, well, excellent. Again, I love the rhyme, the rhythm and blah, blah, blah. She goes, oh, there's a note here. Um, please read this through the eyes. Please read again through the eyes of a firefighter. She was okay. And she got to like the second verse and just broke down crying because she realized then what it was about. You know, I don't know, like the first time she read it, I must, she must have thought it was about like a doctor or something. I don't know, you know, someone who works at Rose. But then she realized what it was about and she couldn't finish it, like, you know, and I had to send her, look, sorry for doing that. Like, but that's, that's kind of an aspect of our job that we have to do, you know. When, um, uh, when I first started in training school, I, um, I was trying to get my head around <clears throat> as in when I first started instructing. And I think about this with my kids as well. I think we reflected on it earlier when we spoke about we absorb, we don't learn. You know, we we see with our eyes, not not just hear with our ears and stuff like that. And it reminded me of um, a poem, I'd rather see a sermon than hear one any day. Do you know that one? No. This is uh, Edgar A. Guest. I remember hearing it. Uh, And it came back to me when I joined training school because it was about you've got to be able to walk the walk, you know, not stand there delivering, reading off presentations and all this sort of stuff. You've got to live it, you know. And it also reminded Mm -hmm. me of this women in the fire service stuff when they're like, you've got to see it to be it. Um, And how our development and everything is a journey. And you've got to walk alongside your mentor, your coach, your instructor, whoever that might be. You've got to walk it side by side. So I've got it up in front of me here. And I'll, and I'll share this one. 
So this is Edgar A. Guest. Um, people can find this one. I'd rather see a sermon than hear one any day. I'd rather one should walk with me than merely tell the way. The eye is a better pupil, more willing than the ear. Fine counsel is confusing, but example is always clear. All the best of all the preachers are the men who live their creeds. For to see a good put in action is what everybody needs. I can soon learn how to do it if you will let me see it done. I can watch your hand in action, but your tongue too fast may run. And the lectures you deliver may be very wise and true, but I'd rather get the lesson by observing what you do. For I may misunderstand you and the high advice you give, but there is no misunderstanding how you act and how you live. When I see a deed of kindness, I'm eager to be kind. When a weaker brother stumbles and a strong man stands behind, just to see if he can help, then the wish grows strong in me. To become as big and thoughtful as I know that friend to be. And all travellers can witness that the best of guides today is not the one who tells them, but the one who shows the way. One good man teaches many men believe what they behold. One deed of kindness noted is worth forty that are told. Who stands with men of honour learns to hold his honour dear, for right living speaks a language which to everyone is clear. Though an able speaker charms me with his eloquence, I say, I'd rather see a sermon than hear one any day. And I loved that when I first read it. I yeah, really yeah, yeah, loved yeah, it. Well, it yeah, was yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. You've got to be it. Yeah. You've got to be it. You've got to embody yeah. it. It was one of my favourites. I really, really liked it. Oh, thank you. Matt, I'm just starting to realise you're, you're more into poetry than I am. Oh, mate. <clears throat> I love some of this stuff. But that's why when I came across you, I was like, oh, man, I've got to speak to Gerard. And this, this guy goes back to the podcast as well, to be honest with you, because your voice is an instrument. And my voice is actually a bit hoarse today. I've got a little bit of a cough. But um, play with it. And they always they also say that the limits of your language is the limits of your world. So language is it's like a living thing, isn't it? A word. A word is always evolving. A word is... There's so much behind a word. It has a whole history. It's like a person. Yeah. Do you know yeah. what I mean? And when you look at... When you look at things like... Um, and just really old literature, even like we look at Macbeth or anything like that, every word is pregnant with meaning. It mm-hmm. just is so heavy. It's, it's barely written in English because the words are so heavy. The words are so overbearing. You have to really sit and read the stuff slowly. And I have, and even with some of these poems, you know, I've had to read single lines multiple times just to go. Yeah. Oh wow! There's three or four ways yeah. I could take that. Yeah, yeah. There's great. There's there is words like that that's carry weight. And I'd like to say the history behind it. I love actually watching Countdown because every now and again they'll give you a word. I think the other day they were talking about like Daisy, where it comes from, and then all the things, the whoops of Daisy, and the, you know, all and lacks of Daisy, oh, and, and the whole backstory. Like it's you're just going, whoa, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And then of course the Irish language, Irish language Gaelic, is is like. Um, it's nearly a different level, you know, where the world's evolved for, like, and there's no real direct translation, yeah. like, you know, and uh, I remember my dad saying, do you like Irish son when I was younger? And I said, no, dad, because we have to learn it, you know, in school. And I said, no, dad, I don't. And he goes, you will someday. And I was like, uh, well, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, and he, and he just grabbed, he grabbed, he grabbed, he grabbed me, you know, and he said, uh, a Vic McCree. And I said, and he goes, son of my heart. And I was like, and he turned, turned and walked away. I was like, man, that's that's epic. You know, a Vic McCree. Like, you know, he's son of my heart. That's all he had to say. And I was like, you know, my dad's still alive. He's like 88. You know, great guy. Worked in Guinnesses from the time he was 14 years of age. Would have been a very poor background. Well, you mentioned to me your um, your dog, who's not very well at the minute, Sersha. She's here. Beside As we were talking about her and the challenges she's going through and stuff like that. Yeah, Sersha, Irish for freedom. Yeah, I, I, lo- I love my, I love my dog because I, when I was chatting up, uh, trying to chat up Steph, my wife, she was work- working in a bar, and I then gone in and they were closing. I only had like about two two points on me, so I was pretty. Uh, and I saw her like she was closing the doors. I was like, any chance we come in? And um, she, uh, 
one of my pals is a bit of a, a kind of a celebrity kind of guy and she didn't know that she wouldn't know him so uh, the other barman said yeah yeah let them in I was trying to chat her up and I was like total Neanderthal stuff you know I've got a pickup truck you know <laughs> I have it have it raised and you know I was just talk, short of telling her how much I benched you know it was just you know and then uh, I was going nowhere and uh, she goes it and I look my friend goes uh, tell him about your dog and she her eyes freaked up and I said yeah I got a dog I got a rescue dog there you know so um she's uh she's here with me so she so uh, I, I always think that I would never have met my wife if it wasn't for the dog you know so the word she was in a pound and she was there for about eight months and um she only um when we set her we set her free no one would take her because of the look of her she kind of has that bull breed look of her so um Saoirse is Irish for freedom so that's why we call her Saoirse so uh, she's here Saoirse come here she's um <laughs> say hello say hello to Pete Bless her. So she had a uh, cancer there, so she got this part of her 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 jaw removed. How's she doing with eating? Uh, she's doing good. We have to hand feed her. Okay, go on, go get. Yeah, that's rough. Your daddy's getting a poetry lesson off. Oh, Jesus Pete. Christ! Don't be daft. I'm, uh, I'm 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 butchering fantastic works. <laughs> and, and it's gas because I know, like stereotypically, like you don't expect guys like us to, to have like to be into poetry. I mean, I went down to the local school here, the primary school. And I was introduced to him. This guy, he's a, he's a, this is Jerry. He's a he's a fire he's a fireman and he's a poet and like the kids don't care. And so uh, they're there. You don't look like a poet, hey. <laughs> and I said, Well, do I look like a fireman? And they were there. Yeah, yeah. And I said, Well, what does a poet look like? Um, they're skinny. They're old. They have glasses. They look like sir, you know. And the teachers just like, thanks, kids, you know. Like, but um. But I think anyone can be in. It doesn't matter what you look like or you know your background. Like if, if something means something to you, let it out. I um, when I was thinking about uh, our conversation uh, coming on today, I was reflecting on I think the first one that we shared together, which was the firefighters' call. Was that the first one we we exchanged on? Yeah, I think so. This yeah, is the yeah, one that's, that's right. really yeah. probably what you're best known for in Europe because you've gone and read this for. Graduates, you've gone and read it at uh, you know brand new starting firefighters. You've done it at I think some funerals for past firefighters and stuff like this. Um, and it's gone. Uh, loads of Americans have caught onto it as well, which uh, always tells me you know how stuff like this is universal. You know, it's uh, it, yeah. it's strange. You could travel all over the world, and we still have so many things that draw us together. We're not so different, you know, despite the different ways we look and different ways we speak. This uh, poetry is kind of that universal yeah. language, isn't it? Yeah, true. Um, yeah, so I wrote. A, I was actually asked by the, the fire brigade, would I write a poem? A kind of um, like the fire, the, the fireman's prayer is there, but they didn't really like the language of it and stuff. It's a bit even the word fireman now is is, is obviously yeah. firefighter, that type of thing. So I said, look, I'm not going to try and replace that, but I I think I know what you're on about. I, I'll, I'll write something, but um. I said it will either happen or it won't happen. I can't force it without sounding too arty. I'm not going to, if it happens, it happens. But at the time, uh, one of the guys in our job, he'd be considered a legend, a guy by the name of Paul Hand, real great guy, tough guy. He passed away. And I was like, right, okay, um, I'm going to write this about, you know, that kind of what Paul, what Paul would like. Imagine if Paul was standing on my shoulder reading it, you know. So that was it. It was kind of inspired by firefighters of Paul Hans ilk because you know if they say like the the souls of great sailors haunt the waves. I think the true is same is true of uh, firefighters that they never truly leave the fire ground and they're always kind of watching out for us. You know the brotherhood, as you say. I think that's more true now than ever has been. We're seeing a lot of people retire in the UK Fire and Rescue Service and they really struggle, really struggle leaving oh, yeah. it behind. Yeah, true. And then, of course, you've all things now that are more topical than ever. Like, I mean, every like, nearly once a month, we're hearing bad news about someone else getting, you know, getting cancer, you know, or, you know, struggling. And it's just, I don't know, I've been to more funerals in the last couple of years. Just guys, you know, not making retirement or just straight out of retirement, you know. So, um, yeah, it kind of has that. But when I was trying to write this poem, I said, right, I wrote down all the buzzwords that you'd associate with the fire brigade. 
um, everything like from you know blazes you know courage ladders cats and trees you name it and I said right I'm not going to use any of these words I'm just going to write about like what calls us to the job what's expected of us when we're in the job and then what happens when we're gone so um that's what that's what the poem is about basically and um it's it kind of caught on then they when i wrote it they asked me would i read it at the pass out which is the recruits and that that was a big deal like because you know you're in your your number one uniform like the chief is there the lord mayor all the flags of the fire brigade the pipe band is there and the, the pipe band would be a lot of our, our senior men you know what i mean they'd be the first to let you yeah. have it like you know um but uh it went really well but um yeah so it was taken then i got um i was interviewed on national radio and that was the first clip you said it for the lord mayor yeah. yeah and then i the the first copies went to the, into the dublin fire brigade museum it's there and there's a candle for paul hand beside it and then the second copy is in uh, over number 10 station at ground zero there in new york that's gotta be surreal it's great, and I'm actually well. I, you didn't get it yet. There's a copy for you in no, the post. So kind of you, thank you. Um, it's so strange to have it out there, though, in America. It's such an inaugural place. It makes you think, like, with the greatest respect, Jesus, has no has no one else done something like this? What is it? And that's what's so. Yeah. That's exactly what I said earlier. Like, you bring words to that visceral, shared feeling that people struggle. It's yeah. like nail hammering jelly to the wall. They just can't get it they can't put it into how they feel yeah. and you managed to deliver that there, there was a, a lady got in touch with me she heard my interview and she sent me a message on um instagram or facebook and she said like yeah, hi jerry you don't know me um, but my dad is a retired uh, station officer he's 92 years of age he knew paul hand and he said basically he's buried all his uh, fire brigade colleagues at this stage and i said but that that poem the way you spoke it meant so much to him and I was like, listen, thanks so much. Um, when I do up the thing, I'm, I'm going to get it, make sure he gets one of the first copies, you know, for what it's worth, you know. Yeah. And she said, thanks Eric, so much. But it turns out her brother's in the job and the man died. He actually died there just in the last week. So I met I met, met the man's son and I said, look, I spoke to your sister. I said, I was going to get her a poem. I said, I, I never got it to her in time. And uh, he said, Jer, your poem, the firefighters call it, that was read out at the funeral. I was like, well, so, so she must have listened back to me and yeah, wrote yeah, down yeah. the words to read it. I was like, man, I moved. They said, well, look, I, I gave them a copy there. I put it in a nice frame and I gave it to them. I gave it to my pal the other day. We'll give that to the family and just say, look, you know, they'll have that now. Like, But to hear something like that, it means so much to them. So the, the poem was getting a bit of traction. A lot of people were looking for it. And because I'd been on national radio talking about like uh, kind of the struggles we faced and the cancers and the, the mental health thing and stuff, we said, um, I said, right, okay, we're going to sell the poem, but all the money goes to charity. So we're like selling it for like, yeah, basically 20 euros. And it's that, uh, that's the, um, I don't know if you see that, the, the Oscars kids, that's probably no, no. backwards or something, is it? But um, it's basically for kids. Um, kids with terminal cancer and obviously it's just to make their their dreams come true before you know the inevitable maybe so some of them obviously there's a big attachment a lot of them want to be in, in the fire brigade so they get inaugurated into like dublin fire brigade and um, so it's just the thing to raise money like we've raised 800 euros so far without, without trying without advertising it or anything awesome. so um yeah it's a good start share like, the but, link um, with us we'll put it in the notes for this podcast as well yeah, um, absolutely. And also, you know, when you shared with me that uh, I think it was an American podcast or something had uh, heard your thing and yeah. they were like, I absolutely love that. And this is a good question for you because I was like, make sure they credit you. Make sure they put, because yeah, this listen. is art. It's not, a, it's not a picture. It's not a, but it is art. It's your intellectual property. It's, um, and we say, yeah. that, and that's why, you know, when I've just read a couple of things today, I'm always make a point to attribute it to the because i didn't come up with this shit you know we're standing on the shoulders of giants someone's poured yeah. their mind into this thing um and that's where i think it's a real uh underappreciated aspect of poetry that the people that come up with it 
how do they how do we sustain that you know i think i spoke to you about patreon i think you should have a patreon page people should be able to access readings um, yeah. from you and stuff like that and be able to support you you know whatever five pound a month two pound i don't yeah. know anything because otherwise people aren't going to create this art you know that's what the music industry went through the same thing if you don't pay them for it they're not going to make music if you're a regular listener to the podcast, then chances are you are big into your own personal development and the development of firefighters around you. So I wanted to remind you of our mobile app drill book. This is a free training and development resources made by firefighters for firefighters. Heading on to Drillbook, you will find internet debriefs, radio messages, knots and lines, quick reference guides, quizzes every single day. We've got useful links to the ERG, to Web Rescue, to Jessup, Euro Rescue, 10 Second Triage, National Operational Guidance. You've got trauma skills sessions and questions in there with 10 second surveys, patient handovers, questioning, bleed controls, vitals, major incidents, and not to mention our daily quizzes where you will find questions on extrication, casualty handling, breathing apparatus, fire development, water rescue, rope rescue, you name it. It is the go-to resource if you've got a spare five minutes on the firehouse to develop yourself and those around you. Not only that, if you're looking to get into the fire service we've got advice on there on interview questions interview answers you can build your own questioning in there we've got radio messages apps where you can develop and put together your own methane if coat and a whole area dedicated to knots and lines and incident debriefs as well all of the incident debriefs that we have gone through on the podcast you'll find them there and again remember this is built by firefighters for firefighters so you can add your own drills in there you can pick the drills that you find the most favorite when you go to search for different drills in there, you can find breathing apparatus, hazmat, incident command, ladder drills, pumping, RTC, trauma skills, winching and recovery, urban search and rescue, height rescue, water rescue. There is literally hundreds of training ideas, hundreds of drills in there. And you can continue to build this library of resource for yourself and for firefighters all around the world. Remember, this app is absolutely free and it grows every single day down to the contributions of our thousands and thousands of users. So if you've got that favorite training drill and you want to share it with somebody else, get in there. If you're looking for ideas for training yourself and your crews, get in there. It's freely available on Android, Apple, and you will find it in the links for this podcast. Remember, it's called personal development. The clue's in the name. You've got to work twice as hard on yourself as you do on the job. So always be growing, always be developing. Now let's get back to the show. Yeah, no, you're right. And uh, I got onto that crowd in America. So they, they took basically the poem that I read it on the interview and they sped it up slightly, which is fair enough. I don't mind. But then they put bagpipes behind it. It actually sounds quite good, but I'm not really credited on it. It says it's on their Spotify, like firefighters call. But to me, every time there's a podcast and they use it, they Absolutely. should be credited. And they haven't done that. That's very um, naughty. I don't like I don't that. Know about it, but like, no, I don't. I don't think it's cool. Um, but I think they will. I hopefully they'll get around to it. Like, um, but actually, I want. I want to thank you because, um, just for your listeners to know what type of guy you are. Like, cause we haven't met. We've only spoken on the phone. But you were so helpful to me. Like telling me about like this. These because this is all yeah. new to me. Like you know, I, I don't do. I don't do Zoom calls. You know, I mean, I don't, I just, you know. Um, so this is all new to me. But you, you, you gave me a great advice about that and about you know protecting my work and because this is so much of you and people will they genuinely will people will tell this poem generations to come i mean how how old are some of the people i've been quoting today but quote you know give a a tribute it to them yeah i'm getting a bit more um trying to get a bit bit more um it's a slow process you kind of have to build it's like kind of nearly building a business building your reputation building your brand if you like and i'm not i'm not in this for money any poems i've ever sold i've always given the money to charity um but that's not sustainable either and this is the thing about um, healthy pride you know don't feel ashamed if someone says oh you know gerard could you come and do a read here or there it's for uh it's for this foundation Yeah. yeah absolutely cover my travel yeah. and uh, cuz this is what we do with the podcast for an example like we don't make any money yeah. with the podcast but i do say to people we'll come and do that but you have to facilitate us as a guest so they pay for our travel and their accommodation and they feed us and that's great and we yeah. and i show up and do the thing i'll i'll speak i'll present i'll host whatever cuz it should be mutually beneficial you don't it should everything should be win 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 for you win for me win for us do you know what I mean? It shouldn't be yeah. you had to travel all this way and you enjoyed it and it was good, but uh, you can't do it every weekend because you had to take leave and it also cost you money to get there on the train and travel to America to do the thing. You, you, you're just going to stop doing it. It's not sustainable. Yeah. Well, that'd be like, that'd be, um, 
in fairness, I had a conversation yesterday with one of the assistant chiefs in the job, and I kind of just telling him, look, we need to kind of, I, I'm literally packaging these myself, put them into, into like a, a card backed envelopes, and then I ran out of card backed envelopes, so I was cutting cardboard and putting yeah. to, to reinforce. And he's if like, they're no, standing look, there making public claims really? and going, oh, we really appreciate Gerard and we're so proud of him. Well, I'll tell you what, we sign a thing that says it's my intellectual property. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and these are not difficult things to do. And uh, and then you as a service, you sort them all out. You can post all these out, you pay for it all, and we give all the money to charity. You don't have to pay me. It's just make sure it's all got my name on it. And then you sort it out. Because people do things like that. They say, it's like virtue signaling. Oh, we're really proud of this. Right, well then support it. Put your hand in your pocket. Yeah. And help. Yeah. Yeah. No, in fairness to the sister, he's going to say, look, we get you, we're going to back you. Yeah, no, I don't think he was aware of what I was even doing. That's what I'm saying. It's not been publicized. I literally I just put it up on my Facebook. I'm selling these copies. Yeah. Contact, him, contact me. Revolute me. 20 euros and I'll send it to you. Um, and we can use the internal post and work because a lot of firefighters buying it. But now people are wanting it outside. And so he's he, they're going to row in behind me, which is great because they're involved in the charity yeah. as well. Like, you know, um, more than, much more than I am, actually. Um, but um, it's, yeah, but I think it's important for people to know what sort of a fellow you are that you took all that time. But we had, we chat for over an hour and you were giving me advice on these things, you know, which would have no benefit to you. You're just doing it out of soundness, you know, and so thanks. But that's the secret know. to all of this. You know, I always say, if we can't help each other out, what's the fucking point in any of it? What's the point in any of this shit? Yeah. You know, we've all heard stories yeah. of people rich and famous sat alone and have had no great experiences. Yeah. Make all your money on the stock exchange and just be a miser, yeah. um, you know, alone in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. You know, like you've been yeah. saying about California right. and your travels, it's all about the experiences. You know, go and have experiences. Yeah. Go and make yeah. connections. Go and make friendships. You know, I'd love for us to be able to meet and have an adventure. We were talking about South Africa, uh, I think, before we came on. Man, just adventures like that. Yeah. That's what I'm in it for the stories. Yeah. I'm in it for the stories and the adventures That's, and the people you yeah. meet. Oh, my God. The uh, fingerprints, the, the million like, fingerprints. Uh, you should yeah. write a poem or something like that. I'm sure you get asked for poems all the time. But there's something in my head, and there's probably a poem out there for it. We are a collection of a million fingerprints. Every interaction we've had, yeah. aren't we? Do you know what I mean? It's everyone that's touched yeah, us in yeah, some true. way has made a mark, and yeah. I just think that's so. Yeah. I it sounds really weird. I want to be touched. You know, I want to be touched by as many people as possible. Let's get get me out there, brother. You know, because that's yeah. what's so beautiful about it all. I I've been through some 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 nasty, unfortunate stuff of all of my own creation. You know, addictions and miscarriages and injuries okay. and damaged relationships family and parents and all sorts of stuff all of my own creation but people that help me through all that stuff man they get paid for any of that shit you know these weren't formal coaching relationships or mentors or sponsors these are people that have just seen seen that you're dragging ass seen that you're you know if you don't get some altitude at some point in time you're gonna you're gonna fucking crash yeah and they've 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 seen something in you and taken the time to fan that flame and gone just come on, you know. Let, I can give you some help, but we need to sort your shit out. Otherwise, you are gonna you're gonna spiral out of control here. You're gonna nosedive. Yeah, and it's great. It's great that you you, you have people like that in your life. You know that will you know have your back or you know yeah. steer you. I've no time right for fair weather you know? friends. People that are just there when yeah. the sun's out and there's barbecue time. Fuck that. Well, I I find that like um, I see it a lot in in. GAA clubs, you know, or, or, or athletic clubs, that when people are at their worst, you know, a loss in the family, say, the neighbour coming along and, and I, I made you a casserole, be, you know, to yeah. save you's cooking, in this type of stuff, that, that, that's, that's hardcore, like, that's, that's, that's stepping up to the mark. And it's amazing, I, uh, one of the lads in work, we're chatting about Oscar, Oscar's kids and his, his kid had cancer and he, he was surprised at who he would have considered his best best mates you know not all of them but a couple of them didn't want to know they were just i don't know if they were scared off by the whole thing but they didn't step up and then other other lads that would have been you know friends really yeah. stepped up became great friends and anything you want it's done you know sometimes it's scary to ask because people don't know what to do like if i ask gerard i was doing and he just breaks into tears what the fuck am i supposed to do with that you know what what am i supposed to do yeah. so they claim respect and go i don't want to ask him i think it's rude to ask 
you know, he's he's might be screaming out for someone yeah. to just ask, just ask, you know, yeah. just and just let me yeah, vomit true. my emotions into this conversation. Don't try and fix it, and just, yeah. just listen. Yeah, yeah, that's all, that's all it is. I think like I, I've had um because where I'm living now, we're only up here the last five years, but it's pretty remote. We're literally on on the side of a mountain, and up behind me is is, is forestry. So I'm up there all the time with the dog. So a good few lads um from work say. We'll come out and go, look, look, let's have a, let's have a chat. Let's have a, have a stroll. There's not, you're not going to meet anyone else from work. Um, and all, all I'm doing is like, I'm not qualified. In this, I'm qualified as a mate. You know, I can listen to people. Yeah. That's it. That's my only qualification. Like, and I said, and you know, like my life's, pretty, my life's, my life's, my life's pretty sweet. I'm happy, you know, um, but, uh, like you can pretty see it here, like still have a lot of work to do in the house. You know, I was actually putting in sockets yesterday trying to get this computer <laughs> sorted for today. Like, I'm, I'm always up to my eyes, but um, coming straight off nights to to try and wire sockets. But um, I think that's all it is. It's just someone to you'd be surprised. Just to, just a text to go. How are you getting on? That's it. You know, it can make a difference um, to people. You know. It's, it's it's not an easy thing to do, like because you feel near. I might be soft by reaching out, like but uh, I think Build some people. Time. need I don't have to speak to people for six know. months and then just out of the blue, you know, I go spend yeah. the weekend with them and it's amazing. Or they message me, or I message them, and then you get on the phone for an hour and a half, and that's great, you know. Yeah, that's what's important. Yeah, but that, they'll, they'll remember that, you know. But the the the, the Africa trip, you'd love it actually. Now it is humbling because you're like. You could be talking to the kids, and they're always fascinated by tattoos, you know, because they have the dark skin. Obviously, they can't get to, they've never seen it, and they're, they're be rubbing yeah. you all over, like, you know, they're t- t- this gas, like, but there'll be a couple of kids there, like, and they'll have sores on their face, and like, that's obviously like HIV. And you know that next year when you're back there, they're not going to be there, you know, that's just the, that's just the way it is. But it's amazing how the world works. Where we, I was standing, um, where putting up blocks and I'm standing on scaffolding and there's a guy beside me and he has a, he's from Armagh, um, a county in Ireland and he has his Armagh jersey on and uh, I said, he goes, are you into the Gaelic football? And I said, oh, I'm into Gaelic and hurling. Yeah, I go, yeah, yeah, it's my, my, my love. I played for my county and everything. And he's like, oh yeah, yeah. He said, I never won a championship, uh, championship medal. I was beaten one time in a final um, in San Francisco and I said, oh, yeah. I said, what, what year is that? And he said, it was 1999. And I was like, oh. I was kind of looking at this. He winded me up. I said, you, that final went to a replay. And he, he stopped. He goes, yeah. He goes, how would you know? I says, because I was playing in that final. I was born. <laughs> and he's like, so here we are. We'd played against each other in San Francisco. And now we are standing on the same scaffolding board, building it, building it like like we're building a classroom in Africa. It's just amazing. And we're like best mates ever since, you know, like this or whatever, 17 years ago, we're still best of mates. And then we knew with so many uh, friends in common. And also another time out there, sorry if I'm going off on a tangent. Um, there was, I used to get a, grinds for my dyslexia in in town and it was a Donegal man um, and the Donegal accent very soft spoken like Donegal I'm from Donegal and it was a guy big mop of uh, black hair glasses a man by the name of Michael McGlynn very nice and he'd always ask me you know would come in on the Tuesday evening my poor mother would drive me drive me to the, the grind and wait outside for the hour and I was there and did you how was your match at the weekend? Did you win? And then I said, oh, we, you know, we, we lost, but we played well. That's the main thing. And right, and then straight into it. So I'm in, a, I'm in sitting at a table in Africa and we're having our dinner. And I'd been in this guy's company for a while. And he's talking with, and it's his accents. You know, he's just talking away. And he's sitting beside me. And, and I start to dawn on me that he's a teacher because they, they send over teachers as well. It does a big education aspect to it and I said uh, sorry Michael this might sound a bit random but did you used to give uh, English grinds in Mount Street in town and he just looked at me and goes because he's balls now right <laughs> no I had a shred of haste and he just goes um, 
Jared, I thought that was you, he said, but I wasn't sure and I didn't want to embarrass you, <laughs> you know, by saying you get English grinds. And I said, and he goes, but he says something lovely to me. He said, of all the students I've ever had, you are the smartest and I'm delighted you've done well for yourself. As in, I was in the fire brigade now and that, you know, and we became, so when I started writing the poetry, um, I sent him one. I, I, I literally wrote my first poem. I know I said I wrote one or two when I was younger, but I hadn't. I got bitten by a dog, actually. Uh, a friend's dog bit me, and I ended up in a hospital for a week. got two operations on my hand, and I was worried about I was worried about my job. I was worried about being able to finish the house. Um, I couldn't, couldn't make a fist with my, with my hand. I was very concerned about it. So uh, someone in work had sent me a poem. It's one of these ones you can listen to, and it's kind of like that um, spoken yeah. word stuff. Yeah, you know, it's like I was listening to it going, "Yeah, grand." And I said, "Look, I I can write poetry, man. I write, you know, I most." That's why I struggle with writing with my first because it is more spoken word. It doesn't rhyme. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it is. And look, it's different. Um, it's uh, poetry so objective. Like people won't like my stuff, and that, that, that's fine. You know, I, I don't. Yeah. It's like art, you know. Um, yeah, so I, I wrote my first poem in the hospital bed and then I wrote another one called Driftwood and I sent it to Michael. I said, listen, do you mind having a read it to see what you think? And he's like, Jared, this is brilliant. Because I knew, I, without sounding arrogant, I knew it was good, okay? Um, so I sent it to him because I just feel he was giving, like, for want of a better thing, he was kind of giving grinds to dummies that were... You know, we were, they were never going to excel in English. We just wanted to try and get through our exams. But now I'm after writing poetry, and I just thought it'd be nice for him to get a pat on the back to say, "Look, I've gone on to do to write." And um, but he was delighted, and he was like, "Look, I might be a little bit biased here, so I'm going to send it off to another team, but keep sending me stuff." So he now he's like delighted that I'm you know making progress and. Like when I've been interviewed in a, on the radio, be, it's nice to be able to mention his name to say like he was very good to me, you know, he, he really helped me. Like so, um, and I had other teachers in school like that that took me under their wing that was that were very helpful. So this is the, the firefighter's call. It's not for fame or fortune that most deem necessary. No, I invest to don a crest for work less ordinary. Nor be it want of medals, cap or polished shoes, but a calling to help others who have everything to lose. To face hell's dancing angels and suppress them with each stride. To search resolve from deep within as loved ones weep outside. To stand with pride and dignity as comrades we remember. Be it pipes lament that fill sad air or silence in September. And may those names that have been etched in brass or granite stone haunt me in the darkness so I never fight alone. And if a colleague's head hangs low from tasting tragedy, let me offer up my shoulder for them to lean on me. But when amazing grace is played, alas for none but me, Lower the flag, but raise a glass, for I'm not far from thee. I'm gathered with the old flames, looking down from God's great height, on call if aid be needed to join you in the fight. That, the last bit where, that that's the cleverest bit in it for the last bit for me, where it's like, um, I'm stood here on call. You know what I mean? I'm always ready for the fight. Call yeah, me back yes, in. So. And that's the thing. And you see them. And the guys and girls, once they're retired and they're still showing up to the station, they attend the retirement dues. Yeah. And, you know, they're always ready. We had our Christmas dinner there on Tuesday. And you the retired lads come up. And, it's, and I, I wouldn't have worked with some of them, you know. But it's just great. They're still a part of it. And I love that about that aspect of the job, that there is these... You know, there's all different, you know, you're going to have your running clubs, athletic clubs and all that, but there's retirement stuff there. And it's great that they're still involved and still around. And it's great that you can show them that bit of respect. I think it's really important for this type of job because it's so much of your identity. 
Do you know what I mean? Most people don't remember that you were an accountant or you were a, you know, a builder or an admin mm-hmm. clerk or whatever. But if you're a firefighter, you're a police officer, you know, you're a, you're a soldier. Yeah, it's eighty percent of who you are so much of the time. And I think when people retire, that's that death of an identity. They get ripped yeah. away from something, that- and it's because it's all consuming. Again, a lot of whole time firefighters are also on call. They live and breathe it. And everyone knows what they do and they yeah. ask you for help on your days off. And if something happens, they turn to you and go, Gerard's a firefighter. You know, you know, he'll help. He'll do something. And you never lose yeah. that. Today's podcast is powered by our partner Lifelines and their revolutionary approach to functional hydration. Just like in firefighting, water is essential for body function, but studies show more than 80% of firefighters are dehydrated. A 25-year study findings from the National Institute of Health showed poor hydration to be linked to early aging and chronic disease and even mild dehydration results in significant negative impact outcomes including headaches, exhaustion, rapid pulse, irritability and poor cognitive function. A study conducted by Yale University showed that participants who were just 1% dehydrated had a 12% increase in errors when performing tasks that required cognitive flexibility. In addition, dehydration is shown to worsen mood and attitude, contribute to confusion and poor decision making and negatively affect memory and judgment. In other words, you really don't want your internet commander, firefighter or for that matter any first responder on a critical scene to be even slightly dehydrated. Mild dehydration occurs when a person is just 1.5% dehydrated, a condition that does not even trigger the third response in most people so just imagine how quickly a firefighter or any first responder can and does become dehydrated in their day-to-day duties which is why i address my hydration first thing every day with lifelines go into the notes for this episode and specifically check out lifelines hydro fuel and hydro og by clicking in the notes for the podcast for a clean energy solution designed for those who demand more from their day now back to the show Yeah, true. I think, and I, actually, I think that's the reason some some guys maybe stay on longer than they yeah. should. Afraid to let go that they're losing. It's it's like it's like the it's like the Shawshank Redemption yeah. when he gets let you out get of prison. Yeah, you know what happens? You know, what happens? Yeah, yeah. Um, but it does carry weight, like jobs, like ours, on like you said, like like being a policeman. Or, I mean, we've all been had a neighbor called in. You know, you know kids had a fall or someone's not breathing, you know, and, or, or stop the car on the way home if there's a kid on the side of the road in a fit, you know, and, and yeah, it does carry, it's a, it, it's a title and people know, you won't know what your neighbours do for a living, unless you're out here, everyone's a farmer, <laughs> but uh, you, won't, you won't know he's a teacher, he's an accountant, blah, 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 but they will know, oh, Pete the yeah. farmer, you know, that's just the way it is. Um, it, it's a, and I like that. It's 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 a it's a nice title to carry. It. It's a nice, it's a great profession. It also makes me represent. think that you can you can still do. Reminds me of the the bluebird song we said earlier, the bluebird poem. People can enter into this stuff at different stages of their life. You know, just because, and it's the same with the poetry again. You know, discovering it at, at twenty six or whatever it was, and having the the bravery to go out and do it. There's another poem that uh, always reminds me of where we are in life and uh, how we can get a win from anything. It was, um, I think I first heard it by a guy called John Wooden. John Wooden was an American basketball coach. And this was actually his favorite poem. And I heard him say it on a TED talk. And then I went down the rabbit hole mm-hmm. to find where it originated from. And it was actually written by a guy called George Moriarty, who was actually a baseball referee. And uh, he came up with this around success and around teamwork and around resiliency and not resting on your laurels i suppose and it's called the road ahead or the road behind have you ever heard it? it's one of my no. favorites and it kind of reminds me of um the other one the speech that was i think it was roosevelt teddy roosevelt uh it gave a speech about leaving leaving it all on the field effectively and i'll, I'll try and find that one in a minute but anyway this one's george moriarty uh, the road ahead or the road behind sometimes i think the fates must grin as we denounce them and insist the only reason we can't win is that fates themselves have missed. But there lives on the ancient claim we win or lose within ourselves. The shining trophies on our shelves can never win tomorrow's game. But you and I know deeper down there's always a chance to win the crown. But when we fail to give our best, we simply haven't met the test. Of giving all and saving none, 
until the game is truly won. Of showing what is meant by grit, of fighting on when others quit, of playing through, not letting up, it's bearing down that wins the cup. Of taking it and taking more until we gain the winning score. Of dreaming there's a goal ahead, of hoping when our dreams are dead, of praying when our hopes have fled, yet losing, not afraid to fall, if bravely we have given all. For who can ask more of a man than giving all within his span? Giving all, it seems to me, is not so far from victory. And so the fates are seldom wrong. No matter how they twist and wind, it's you and I who make our fate. We open up or close the gate on the road ahead or the road behind. And I love that one. I've said it to my kids so many times. Because whenever you go through something, it's like, is this beginning or is it the end? It's entirely up to you. Do you know what I mean? Don't rest on yesterday's victory. Don't rest on your laurels. It's up to you. Do you want to attribute everything to fate and to the world's out to get me and I'll never get that promotion and that first bit, you know, sometimes I think the fates must grin as we denounce them and insist the only reason we can't win is that they have missed. That is just so, it's like we're saying, it's like cursing at at the clouds, at the gods and shaking your fist in the air. Why have you betrayed me? Yeah. No, you've 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 done it yourself. Yeah, I always have that. Like, I have a line in a poem. I said, "Like believe in fate, but don't wait for its call. As opportunities yeah. may pass you by." You know, it's like um, you know, I, I like a bit of fate. You know, I like a little bit of holy God. But you can't, you can't, you can't just wait for that to come along. You know, you got to make things happen. Like, it, like if you're in a match and you're not getting the ball, yeah. you got to look for the ball. Did you, you ever know? hear the so, joke about the uh, the man that's drowning in the ocean? There's a religious man, we'll not say what religion, but there's a religious man drowning in the ocean. And um, a <clears throat> guy comes by on a rowing boat and he's like, get in, get in. He's like, no, the Lord will save me. And he goes, oh, fine, but I'm telling you, it's cold. Yeah, it's yeah. Okay. Next, a uh, massive um, cruise liner comes by. Huge thing. Everyone's partying on it. And they're like, does someone in the water shout down to him? We've got champagne. We've got steak. Come on, come on board. It's freezing cold. The Lord will save me. I, I don't need your help. Thank you. Yeah. And then finally, when they get back to shore, they, they tell the Coast Guard and they fly a helicopter out there. And the helicopter's there and the guy jumps yeah. off and he swims up to him and says, you've got to come in, sir. You know, it's getting dark. You, you're going to die out here. And uh, he says, the Lord will save me. And eventually they just have to leave because the helicopter runs out of fuel. And the guy dies, unfortunately. He passes away. And uh, he gets to the gates of heaven and says to God, why did you betray me? He said, I sent you two boats and a helicopter, brother. Come on, what, what, do you, what are you expecting me to fucking do here? <laughs> you've, got to, you've got to meet me halfway, man. <laughs> what do you want me to do? Yeah, 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 yeah. And you've got to have a plan for yourself, haven't you? Yeah, very you know, good. Yeah. I always say, if you don't have a plan, yeah, you'll fit into yeah. somebody else's plan. And guess what they've got planned for you? Fuck all. Not because they hate you, not because yeah. they're malicious, because cause Gerard's got his own life. Mm-hmm. You know, he's got his own dreams. He's got his family. He's got his dog. Yeah. He's got Saoirse. He's got his missus. He has got to do what is in yeah. the best intentions for his life. And you've got to grab the fucking steering wheel. Pick up the pen. Write the next chapter. I know. The, the time, the chapters are being written. Yeah. Your life, that book is being written every day. But who's writing it? Are you even holding the yeah. steering wheel? Yeah, true. It's amazing because like I'm I'm 48 now and I noticed that I'm I'm still trying to train like I'm a, like I'm a young fella like I'm, but uh, even lads more uh, you're not getting any younger or this I go I I don't yeah. I don't need to hear that like you know what I mean I I I just what no, story I, are you I'm telling still because that's what life is life is the story you're yeah. telling yourself and 48 years young and people are like oh fucking yeah. shut up Pete what's that bullshit the average male dies at something like 82 yeah. or 84 in the UK so you're only mm. just halfway. You've ju- you're in the second half of the game. Yeah. It's near the end if yeah. you want it to be. Yeah. This is what makes me worry when people say retirement. Yeah, I'm like, what are you going to do when you retire, Gerard? I'm going to do nothing. I'm going to sit up. Yeah. Then you'll probably be dead yeah. in a year or two. Yeah. Your mind, yeah. your body. Yeah. Yeah. Without you a purpose, go. man will perish. With a purpose, you know, man will crawl across broken glass. Yeah, true. I, I live my life. I have this rule that I've lived my life, my whole life by. And it's the rule of <laughs> yeah. Rocky. And it's just, I, I just ask, I just ask me a crossroads in life, two decisions. I just ask myself, uh, what would Rocky do? Mate, I'm going to take it. this off the wall. That's so it. Show it to you. So up above my, uh, yeah. this is above my desk. <laughs> oh man, listen. You have to wait one second. There he is. 
People roll their eyes, mate. People, uh, people hate it. But this one is all about. It's, it was actually from his most recent Rocky, where he was like, um, it ain't about how hard you hit, it's about how hard you can get hit and keep moving forwards. It's what you can take and keep moving yeah. forwards. That's that's what it's all about. That's <laughs> how Injuries, is done. Snap tendons, <laughs> miscarriages, this, and fucking what? Do you know what I mean? We've got friends from the military who've had limbs blown off and they're competing in the Invictus Games. Yeah. What was your excuse again? You've got the dodgy shoulder or you missed the promotion at work? Who gives a fuck? Yeah, I used to. I used to do this. I, I was a bit. I was a bit demented now when I was. I was playing. Um, when I was playing hurling, especially, I used to. Um, the Irish Wheelchair Association is in Clontarf, where I'm from. I used to. I used to walk by that on the way to my matches to let myself know. And you'd, you'd see the kids in the wheelchairs, whatever men in wheelchairs, just to let myself know how lucky I am for remind myself on the way to games. Bit mad, but it worked for me. You know what I mean. I was just like, you got to. I remember know, uh, to your maker, reading this, you know, a short a mental swish. It was in a book, and uh, it was the difference between I get to versus I've got to, and like it's people that get up and say, yeah. I've got to walk the dog, or I've got to go for a run. You mean you get to? Do you know what I mean? One day, so yeah. so she's not very yeah. well. She won't be with you forever. My wife won't be with yeah. me forever. I will not be able to run one day. So at the minute, I get to run. Mm. You know, I get to go and exercise. Yeah. There are people sat in wheelchairs. There are people sat in beds. And when you go, oh, fucking hell, I've got to go and do this. They stare at you. They're, they must make their blood boil. Say, you ungrateful son of a bitch. You know, I saw a guy doing an ultra marathon on a, on a cross trainer, on a, on a treadmill. Um, and it said on the, he had it on a piece of tape. I think he was a Marine. And it said, for those who can't. Because again, he'd had friends who had had put in wheelchairs and had let their legs blown off, and would love to take those steps, but they can't. Oh, yeah, it's true. I, my my little dog is pining here beside me. She's just petting her. But um, I I remember been on the ambulance. This is um, it kind of kind of reminded of it now and again. Just reminded of it there. Obviously, um. I wasn't long in the job, and I was in the back of the ambulance, and we we're bringing this kid who's very badly disabled. And um, he was in his mid twenties, but he couldn't communicate. The only way he could communicate was literally through his eyes, and uh, his hands worked. That was pretty much it. But I'm in the back there, and I'm saying to him like, "Look, you're going to be okay." And he reached and he grabbed my hand, and he squeezed it like, and I looked at him, and he kind of nearly tears in his eyes, and I looked away. I couldn't look, and I, I went to look away, and he squeezed my hand, and it was he was like, he's like, "Look at me." You know, and I, 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 th- that's what he was saying to me. But I remember going, Jesus Christ, man!" And I didn't know what to say. I didn't know how to apologize. I, I, I just got the vibe he was envious of, envious of me, because I had my health. You know, I, and it stayed with me. Like you know, I, I, that stayed with me. That's probably the hardest thing I was case I was ever at. Like there was, it was, there was no blood, no guts, no nothing. It was just like, like a guy telling me, "Man, you, you, you're blessed. Like, look at me. Like what, what have I got?" Like. You know, the guy wouldn't have even had the capability of ending his own life. Like he was so dependent on other people. Like, and it's just just a horrible way to be. Like, obviously, he didn't he wasn't comfortable with it. And I'm, you know, so uh, yeah, I, I never take it for granted. You know, yeah, it's, it's like you only like when I when I lost the pair of my hand. It's only then you miss it. You know, you realize. You know, even trying to cut the grass with a lawnmower was a struggle. You know, it's like. Or if you ever hurt your yeah, back and you've you ever hurt your back, you know, roll the day you wake up with toothache, on. nothing else matters in the world. Yeah. You're just like you can't you can't yeah. do anything. Yeah. Or you you know, you've got earache or toothache yeah. or migraine. You're just like but then every other day you wake up without toothache or migraine, you just take it for granted. You're just like, ah, oh, what's next on the list? It's just like, Oh my yeah, foot exactly. hurts today or it's raining outside. I haven't got toothache today. What a great day. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, it's it, it is great, but it's, it's um, yeah, everyone does does take stuff for granted, I guess you know. Um, I, I try not to, but my whole, my thing I love about the Rocky the Rocky story even more than the movies was his 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 like Stallone's like determination to get there. You know what I mean? Everything he said, I'm sure you know. You know, even selling his own dog, you know, and your man yeah. wanting to be in the part and play Spider Rico or whatever, you know, like, and. Uh, 
but like that's hardcore man that's uh, you know that's why I, I see that I see that every morning you know like you know and then when Rocky 6 came out like you know he, he goes outside and in, in, in the cold he's like and he does his pull ups like, I still do my you know I love the rawness of it like you know I love it it's great it's great you know? well look so, brother I want to be respectful of your time we've spoken for like two hours there no, I absolutely love that I feel like we could go another two hours yeah um I want to be respectful of your time. If people want to uh, connect with you, if people want to make contact, what is the best way for people to reach out to you? Would you prefer, what do you want us to put in there for you? Is it an email address? Is it a social media handle? What would be best if people want to want to get in contact? Yeah, I have that. Uh, that I, I don't get a little card. That, that's uh, Jared Divine Poetry. I'm trying to set up the website there so if people wanted to buy that poem or support it. And Pete, that was another thing I was going to say to you. Um, I'm trying to get I'm trying to get the, the angst to do it as well. I'm kind of, we're, we're selling this poem here and we're raising money for a charity that's fire brigade related. I'm, I'm trying to make contact with the, the Leary Foundation, which is Dennis Leary. Um, they do great work over there. Say you guys over, over in the UK. If you had a, a cause like that, you take this poem and you could take it on yourself and you you spread it you you share it you you charge for it basically do what i'm doing and keep the money you look after your own finances your own charity i you know let it generate good because i i think i think it's going to i think it's going to travel you know it is already is starting to travel and i have a few connections in the uk now i need to talk to but i'd love it um i'd love to see it doing good over there if it can do what if it can do in the uk what it's going to be doing here and it's the same in the states like but uh, it's too much for me to manage, and I'm, I'm not about it's that a anyway. Lot. So I just like lot. someone else. Will <clears> we will. So we've, we've got the yeah. link for your Instagram, uh, and we'll put that in there as well. Uh, yeah. I'll also place. Is it appropriate to put an email address in there as well? Is that appropriate or not? Yeah, I have my email. If you, if yeah. you want to e- email me, but whatever. Yeah, the Instagram is um, it's Instagram at Jared Divine uh, hyphen. Yeah, Jared Divine hyphen that? poetry. So if people look in the notes below to this, they will see a link to your Instagram because I've just got it up here now so I will put that underneath the episode notes so people can go and find you mate I've absolutely loved that thank you so much for your time today really really appreciated it Uh, I would sincerely love to have another chat with you uh, later on in in, in 2024 and hopefully we can find time to go and have an adventure somewhere together but uh, it's been awesome my friend no Pete I I swear to God and um, you know, you strike it, strike it off of people. I just chat to you. I was like, Tan said, man, he's, he's a legend, man. He's like, he's like, he's like me, like, you know what I mean? Um, um, so, um, yeah, and I was actually doing this. I, I, I was there thinking, I'd actually love to fly over and meet you, shake your hand, you know what I mean? Well, mate, in uh, in January or February, I don't know when this come, will come out because we've got loads of episodes recorded. I'll actually mm-hmm. be over in Ireland. Um, I'm due to go over there with uh, oh, Simon Either. Hunter Hunter Apparel they are based over there and I'm going to right. go over and spend a bit of time with them it's actually yeah. reminded me to do a follow up call with them to see when we're going to do it but when I've got the yeah. dates I'll let you know and uh, hell or high water I will find my way to you yeah look you have somewhere to stay here uh, I'll pick you up from the airport and all that there's no problem um, yeah we use Hunter um, I think they're moving up north now they're moving there they're, they were based in, they were based in Dublin and now what they're doing, fire brigades from all over. But I'm not sure. But anyway, mate, you have somewhere to stay here. There's no problem. There's just me and Steph and uh, spare room there. It's nice. We're like, I'm, we're like, say, 20 minutes, half an hour from Dublin. But like, man, I'm looking at the lake now with trees and squirrels and all that shit. Like, oh, that is beautiful. Fucking, like we've re- red squirrels and we've deer come into the garden and stuff. Like, you know, we don't have massive, uh, about an, an acre and a half. But I was... Like my pal was here last night, the farmer guy, and uh, saying like, "I never had yeah. a lawnmower before." You know, <laughs> I'm, a city, I'm a city kid. It's great, and uh, that's why I love like I love the local down here because they're just like me, like because I'm from Dublin, like you know, and I'm just like, it's just like you go in there, lads and wellies and stuff, and it's just everyone <laughs> drinking pints of Guinness, you know, and, and whiskey. It's just, it's just great crack, like awesome. Like that, you know, right, my man. I'm gonna let you go, but uh, send my love to the good lady, and I look forward to speaking with you soon. Yeah, thanks, Pete. Fair play. Thank you.
The Firefighters Podcast was created to recognize, acknowledge, inspire, and hopefully even motivate these incredible individuals who have chosen to be part of the first responder community. Our driving purpose is to create a legacy resource for the current and future generations of firefighters and first responders. We get some incredible feedback from listeners and guests. And as the podcast grows, our desire to create longevity and sustainability means that we are asking for the support of our listeners. If you want to support the podcast, if you want to get discounts to our merchandise, hoodies, clothing, coins, patches, tablets, and also access to all of the incredible documents get shared with us from our podcast guests and sector leaders and please head over to our patreon page and for just three pound a month you can support the future of the podcast please finally hit that follow subscribe or rate button on the platform you're listening and wherever you're in the world please support your emergency services responders and thank you for listening